Hi everyone, welcome to Shake Your Musings with me, Phil Saker. It is the 21st of April 22 and it is episode 31 of the podcast and today we are starting a new series looking at an overview of how to build a Christian worldview. So as I promised last week on the podcast, and this is the start of a new series, and I'm going to make this available as a kind of separate video as well. So it won't just be part of the podcast. It will also be on YouTube um, kind of separately about building a Christian worldview as a separate series. And this is uh, how you can um, construct a worldview, what a worldview is. Of course, we looked at how we can construct a Christian one and then start thinking about how that might apply in different topics, um, different kind of areas of life, how a Christian worldview could make a difference. So that's something that we're going to to be um, be thinking about um, a bit later on in the podcast. That will be the main segment um, and also available on YouTube. Before we get to that, as usual, I'd just like to begin with one or two articles and things which I found interesting over this last week. Um, So there's a couple that I wanted to highlight this week, um, one of which is uh, from Christian Concern, an article written on the 14th of April, so a little, a few days ago, by uh, Tim Dieppe, um, called Sir David Amos, Victim of Islamic Terrorism. And I think this is a really good article, but just talking about how the killer of David Amos was acting under sort of explicitly Islamic, um, you know, beliefs. And um, it was for the the glory of of Allah and um, copying, you know, um, the the, sort of looking at the Quran and and so on. And um, this is something which Western elites, you know, MPs and, and the media are just so completely uninterested in that angle you know that after David Amos was murdered then they they were talking about social media and the need to regulate social media which is ridiculous you know that 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 had very little to do with his murder and much more this kind of Islamist terrorism was was the cause of it and yet no one is talking about that and of course if if it had been a far-right extremist if it had been um, someone who uh, was from the opposite kind of political uh, persuasion, of course, they would be hunting down that ideology um, very quickly. Uh, It just seemed like we have this kind of blindness when it comes to Islam. And this is why it's really important to be looking at worldviews as well, because I think a lot of Westerners, particularly those in um, politics, those in the media, have this idea that all religions are basically the same, all religions promote peace and promote, you know, good and well-being, um, uh, but that's not the case. That you know, if you look around the world, at who is um, persecuting who? I think um, that Muslims are, you know, one of the biggest persecutors, and Christians are the most persecuted group of of religious uh, believers around the world. Um, so this is, you know, our worldviews make a difference. What we believe makes a difference. Um, if we, as a society, can't talk about that, then you know we're dead in we're dead in the water so yeah that, i think that was a really interesting and really good article although it exposes um, sadly i think the failure of our elites and the failure of our media to really deal with the truth um, we can't deal with the truth it seems you can't handle the truth um so that's the first article i'll put the links to these down below by the way the second article and this is this is worrying this is on LifeSite News, uh, an article which says uh, British children up to 52 times more likely to die following a COVID shot, a government report. Looking at data from the Office of National Statistics, which shows a stark increase in deaths among children, both single and double jabbed, compared to their unjabbed counterparts. Now, um, when the, the vaccine first came out, like um, a lot of people, I had my reservations that they, they developed it so quickly. But, you know, I went along with it. I mean, I, I didn't get the vaccine myself um, because I, I thought I'm not at risk of COVID probably. And I'm, you know, not very likely, more likely to get a severe adverse reaction. Um, 
but the you know the way that the the way that the vaccine rollout has been it's become almost or not so much now but there was a phase when it was almost like a religious mania and particularly the way that the vaccine has been rolled out to children i think it is it is utterly utterly wrong and it's it's worse than wrong i mean this is this is the you know almost the worst kind of wrong really if if there are if that that makes sense you know that it's child abuse um, the fact that children have been made to have a vaccine which they didn't need and there are children who have died through having the vaccine um, and they didn't need it and that's what i think is just so so wrong the fact that children have been thrown under the bus and you know um to to, to protect supposedly protect adults and you know that i think i really hope that the people who have perpetrated this the people who have called for vaccines for children the people and the pot the politicians who have enabled it the doctors who've enabled it the um you know all of the committees and so on and the media who haven't questioned it i really hope that they will be held to account because i think this is child abuse i don't think there's any other word for it at this stage you know it seems like the evidence is there and it seems like that no one really in a position of authority is keen to look into these things. And that's a travesty. That's an absolute travesty of justice. So, yeah, um, you might like to have a look at that article as well. And I'll put the link to that um, down below. And, um, you know, I think we need to be praying that, you know, God will bring about justice because this is this is not just this is not right. OK, so those are the couple of things that I wanted to mention. So let's move on now to the main section of the podcast. We're thinking about uh, starting to think about building a Christian worldview. So today we're going to be starting to think about how to build a Christian worldview. And what we're going to be thinking about today is uh, what the different alternative worldviews are, what a worldview is, why it matters and um, why you will want to, to choose a Christian worldview. And then we're going to start to think about how you can begin building that. And in the next session, we'll actually get into the, the specifics of it. Um, we're just, just going to be looking at an overview today, uh, really. So worldviews. Um, let's just have a brief recap of what a worldview is. Those of you who are joining us new, I'm, I looked at this on the Sacred Musings podcast, um, episode 28, which was about uh, three weeks ago as I'm recording this. Um, but um, I think it's worth repeating because, uh, you know, this is this is important stuff. You know, what is a worldview and why does it matter? So let me quote you. Um, this is taken from a website called Worldview U, um, which is a, a website all about worldviews. And um, they are. Um, yeah, this is what they have to say about it. A worldview is a way of looking at and explaining life and the world. It serves as a lens through which the world is interpreted. It is a set of beliefs that influences a person's perspective, values and actions. A worldview is a type of belief system or ideology. A person's worldview can influence the way everything in the world is viewed, interpreted and explained. A worldview typically addresses life's biggest questions, including how did we get here? Why are we here? Where are we going? Who's in charge? what is true, what is right, and what is wrong. So a worldview is really, if you like, the lens through which we look at the world. And the the, the reason why it's important to look at is because most people just look at the world and assume the way that they look at the world is correct and the natural, normal way that you look at the world. But actually... Um, that's not the case. So most of us in the Western world, for example, carry with us a lot of you know, baggage, a lot of assumptions about what's right and wrong, uh, which are not shared by other parts of the world or by um, civilizations in history. And the reason for that is because we in Western societies have been profoundly, deeply influenced by Christianity. This is what Tom Holland um, points out in his book Dominion. And um, again, I know I recommend that a lot, but I think it's well worth reading. So everything that we hold dear 
really in the Western world comes from Christianity. And I think the problem that we've experienced over the last um, few years is that people think, still think in kind of Christian categories in some ways, but not in others. And there's a real inconsistency there. And, uh, and it's because we haven't actually examined our worldview. We haven't examined where our values come from. Um, so that's why looking at worldviews is really important. Um, so what alternatives are there for worldviews? You can have a non-religious worldview, that is an atheistic worldview, if you believe God does not exist. And what you're left with in that scenario, and this is what um, Francis Schaeffer observed, he was um, sort of a theologian or think Christian thinker from the 20th century, this is what he described it as, the impersonal plus time plus chance. And that's what he described it as, the impersonal plus time plus chance. So you have to explain the existence of the universe in an impersonal way. You have to say whatever, whatever it is that created the universe was not a personal God, was something impersonal, some impersonal process which brought the universe into being. And we are here simply as a product of time and chance, that nothing was intended, nothing was planned. We just happened to, to come forward out of nothing. And it was entirely chance. It was an entirely chance affair. Now, that belief ends up with really no ultimate meaning, because how can there be if, if we're only here because of because of chance? Uh, everything about our lives is um, is meaningless really it's it's only the meaning that we give it ourselves and the meaning that we give it ourselves is um, not really any meaning at all is it if we only bestow meaning ourselves now this is what um, the kind of thing that Richard Dawkins said this is from the blind watchmaker the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design no purpose no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And that's what Richard Dawkins said. Um, and this is the the non-religious worldview. It's just everything is the impersonal plus time plus chance. I think most people find this worldview um, unconscionable, really. I, I just don't think most people want to go for it, which is why you don't actually find many atheists, many true atheists at least. I'm not sure if there ever really has been a true atheist in in the the, the proper the proper sense who follows the you know, logical conclusion all the way through. And people who tried it, like a Nietzsche, ended up going mad. Um, but yeah, um, I think people recoil from this kind of view of the world because it's horrific. Um, so people tend to opt for a a religious worldview. Although, again, when it comes to religious worldviews, there are lots of different um, options. So um, the religious worldview, of course, is I'm just saying when, when I say religious worldview that there is a some kind of supreme being. There's something greater than ourselves and um, who, ha who um, has created the universe. And within that, those parameters, there are obviously that that includes a lot You know, all the, the major uh, world religions and uh, and so on. Um, but the specifics vary wildly. So, for example, Buddhism talks about, you know, how our, we need to become one with the universe. That's the problem that we need to become one with the universe. And that pain is simply a, a perspective on ourselves and that we need to see things from another perspective. So I, I remember talking to um, um, a, someone I met at a wedding a few years ago who um, had embraced uh, Zen Buddhism and um, he was taught I, my mum had recently passed away and I was talking to him about that and I wasn't massively impressed with you know the idea that pain is simply something that we need to see from another perspective but but there we go that's that's the thing that every religion has an answer to the the big questions of life why are we here you know what's right and wrong all of that kind of thing some religions believe it's okay to um, to stone people or to stone gay people or those who've been women who've been caught having an affair all of that kind of thing 
um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, that's that's worldview. So why then would you choose the Christian worldview? Um, because in this in this um, series we're going to be thinking about the Christian worldview. Why would you choose it? Um, well, I would say that it's a commitment to the truth, in particular based on the historical facts of the resurrection. Now, I believe in Christianity because I believe it is true. I don't think it's just a, a useful fiction. And we looked at this on the podcast a few weeks ago, whether um, God was just a useful fiction. Um, now, I believe that you know, Jesus really did die and was raised again. And there is good evidence to believe that. Um, so, for example, there was a classic book called Who Moved the Stone by a man called Frank Morrison. And um, he was a sceptic uh, looking at the evidence for the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he basically wanted to disprove it, to say, well, it's just a load of nonsense, isn't it? So he started researching and did a lot of research and ended up writing this book, having been convinced that actually Jesus did die and rise again, that it was all true. So I believe that you know, Christianity is true and that it is based on solid um, historical evidence and, and all of those kind of things. Now, that's not the only reason. Um, you know, I think it makes sense as well. It makes logical sense, everything, you know, um, all of that. But at the end of the day, I think there is good sound evidence that Christianity is true and other worldviews are not. That's that's the important point. Um, so, the, yeah, the first thing is commitment to truth. The second thing is the historical tradition, the, um, the long history of Christendom and Western civilization. So why would you choose to um, look at the Christian worldview? Well, that's the worldview which we in the Western world have just had for many, many years, for centuries. And it's influenced us profoundly. And so it's not a um, there's no kind of shame in in looking at it and saying, well, how did it lead to to these all the good things which we're experiencing and enjoying today to freedom and, you know, democracy and all of those kind of things. Um, and the, the final thing, why would you choose the Christian worldview? The final thing is just pragmatism. You know, it works. And I think this is something which, um, you know, you can see as you look around the world that countries which have embraced Christianity I think tend to to be flourishing and to have a kind of freedom and, and happiness which countries that have not embraced Christianity do not have so you can see how the Christian worldview kind of leads to leads to human flourishing uh, and I think that's actually quite um, quite obvious if you look around the world um, I'm not saying that being just being pragmatic about it is the is the um you know the right or the only way of looking at it but you know just to, to it's good to know that it works you know that that's the thing that it actually works as a worldview so that's that's something that we should uh, we should keep in mind so there are a couple of um prerequisites before we start looking at um at the Christian worldview um a couple of things that we need to accept before we start examining it and understanding it. Um, and these are fairly simple and straightforward, but nonetheless, I think they're really important to have up front. The first one is that God exists. Um, now, I talked about this back on the Sacred Musings podcast, episode 29. So, you know, I'm not going to rehash all of that, but um, believing that God exists I think is is fundamental if you believe that God doesn't exist and you still want to look at you know kind of accept the Christian worldview then that's impossible you know you can't say that Christianity is a good way of living and I like it but I don't think God exists because then that you lose any authority that that it has and your arguments become entirely about um, pragmatism or you know whatever it may be I think that, you know, Christianity only has any power, only has any, um, you know, purchase because God does actually exist. And we need to we need to acknowledge that we need to understand that 
uh, first of all before coming now if you are someone who's coming and you're not sure whether god exists then that's that's fine i mean i'm not not browbeating you and saying you must you must accept this but what i'm saying is that uh, in my view it, it doesn't make any sense uh, to to look at a christian worldview unless you accept that god does exist and i hope that over the coming weeks we will see how that is the case because you know all of everything in the christian world is is founded on that one thing so that's the first thing the second thing is that the bible is god's word and primarily how he uh, communicates with us so um this is something again which you know we need to we need to to have down as a as a as a prerequisite you know saying this is this comes first i know that you know some people who have um you know if you've been coming from a place of you know not not knowing anything about about god um you know then saying um well the bible is god's word may be a, a step which you're not quite ready to take yet uh, as well but throughout the the history of western civilization the bible has been the cornerstone of the here we go this book has been the cornerstone of what um of the the debates around around god around christianity around what it means and the bible has been fundamental to that and you can't understand the christian worldview without understanding the bible so i'm not asking you to kind of um at this stage to believe in every kind of word literally and, and actually i think it's it's sort of more complicated than that but i just want to say the bible is god's word to us that's how he communicates let me just read you a couple of bible verses to show that i'm not just making this up um out of my out of my my own head but this is actually what's contained within the bible itself so there are a couple of verses from the new testament uh, which back up what i've what i've said uh, all scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness that's 2 timothy chapter 3 verse 16 uh, from the new testament so all scripture is god breathed that's like it's got the breath of god in it you know the, the holy spirit of god um that although it's written down by by man it was actually god speaking through the holy spirit and this is again what the second verse that i've got there says uh, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will but prophets though human spoke from god as they were carried along by the holy spirit that's 2 peter chapter 1 verse 21 so again you know human beings wrote down the bible but they were inspired by the holy spirit it was god speaking through human agents and that's why we need to look at the bible because it's god speaking to us and that's how we understand the christian worldview is through the bible so um yeah the bible is fundamental to the christian worldview and that's something that that will you know come ag uh, again and again I'm, I'm not going to try and defend the bible as such we're just going to look at what it actually says and i think that's actually in my view the best way of defending the bible just simply looking at what it says rather than trying to go into all of the textual criticism and the history of manuscripts and all of that kind of stuff um, that's interesting but at the end of the day it's better to look at what it actually says okay um now again just another word before we get onto the real meat which is um i wanted to say something about theological liberalism versus traditional christianity because this is something which i know a lot of people have been um, have seen happening especially when it comes to the church of england over the last uh, few years so theological liberalism what is that it's different to political liberalism there are things um, I like about political uh, liberalism, you know, we're just kind of saying, well, we want to let people get on with uh, with their lives. We don't want the government to be involved too much. And I think I say, oh, yeah, oh, I'm into that in, in many ways. Um, but actually, theological liberalism is different. Theological liberalism is uh, fundamentally another religion to Christianity. And it uses Christian concepts and it uses Christian words. It talks about believing in Jesus 
but it's fundamentally a different religion. Um, and this is what J. Gresham Machen wrote in his classic book, Christianity and Liberalism, which was published in 1923. So actually very nearly 100 years old now. Um, uh, Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gresham Machen, um, who was uh, at Princeton, I believe, in America. Um, and, and this is the thing, that liberalism is parasitic on Christianity. But what it basically does is it empties Christianity of all of its kind of, or most of its moral concepts and replaces them with worldly ones. And so, for example, this is why many um, in the church today are advocating for things like same-sex marriage, even though the Bible clearly says that marriage is between a man and a woman. And and that's how it is. You know, that that's how God made the world. And, and you can't you can't undo that from the Bible. But this is why um, many in the uh, in the church are you know, going down this road, it's, it's liberalism coming in. It's basically taking the world's values and replacing Christian values and the Christian worldview with the world's values. And you see this happening in the Church of England. You know, you see this happening with Justin Welby, for example, who recently got in the news for saying that the, you know, the government's Rwanda plan for um, asylum seekers, he said, cannot stand up to the judgment of God. Well, that may be his opinion, but it's certainly not the only Christian opinion uh, out there. And there are many Christians, I think, who could support the plan for other, other um, looking at, you know, other other things. And um, yeah, anyway, um, many people have seen that over the last few years, the Archbishop, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury, other bishops have been saying things which are just, uh, you know, seeming to, you know, take as... Um, to make Jesus, if you're co-opting Jesus to a political cause or to, you know, a worldly kind of way of looking at things, raising taxes, for example. Um, and that's not the case. So this is why it's so important to understand the Christian worldview, because when we understand it, we know where we're going wrong. You know, we know um, what is what is Christian and what's not. And I, I really think part of the problem with a lot of the bishops in clergy uh, in the Church of England and actually I mean it's across various denominations is that we don't know the Christian worldview well enough you know we need to look more deeply into it to understand the way that that God wants us to be and um, it's so easy to be superficial um, but actually you know if we're superficial all we will do is just take on the values that everyone is saying which is which is not right okay so we're um, coming to the end of this particular session, but this is what we're going to be doing over the coming weeks. Um, I thought I'd just give an overview of the, the Christian worldview in four steps. These four steps are what we're going to be looking at in the next few sessions, and we're going to be going into each one in more detail. But let's have a brief overview of it now, just to show you where we're going. <clears throat> so it starts out with the creation that's um, the first fundamental thing which is important, that, that God made the world and God made the world in a particular way. And you can read about that in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. God made the world. The second thing is that then there was a fall, as we call it, which is where sin entered the world and it affected everything. Um, it affected ourselves as human beings and it affected the world it affected the universe and things are broken because of because of the fall uh, you can read about that well especially in genesis chapter 3 but in genesis uh, chapters 3 to 11 it's it's really um, going through that um, so that's creation fall the third step is redemption and that is the message of um, god's redemption of the world especially ultimately through jesus christ um, so the salvation plan of God through Jesus and that is you can read about that from Genesis chapter 12 onwards about Abraham but it's particularly in the New Testament um, obviously what you know Jesus was um, predicted in the New Testament um, 
uh, predicting the Old Testament, sorry, is prophesied in the Old Testament. But it, it, it comes out kind of clearly in, uh, in the New Testament. And then uh, the fourth step, the final step, is the consummation. That is how in the future everything uh, will be redeemed through Jesus Christ. And, um, and there will be a new creation. And you can read about that. Well, in the New Testament, but particularly in the book of Revelation, at the end of the book of Revelation. I did do a series on Revelation on sacred musings, by the way, um, and you might like to have another uh, have a look at that. If you haven't already, work your way through the book of Revelation, just thinking about that. So those four steps, the creation, fall, redemption and consummation are the four pillars, if you like, of a Christian worldview and they're fundamental to understanding um, the world from a Christian perspective and we're going to be looking at each of those in turn over the next four four weeks. Um, so that's yeah what we're going to be doing that's um, that's what I've just said and once we've done that once we've looked at those four pillars then I'll, um, what we'll do is we'll look at different aspects of of life thinking maybe about government or morality or, or other things you know and thinking how they fit into the christian worldview and how we can how it makes a difference really to how we see life but before we get to that we need to put the pieces in place so we're going to put the the pieces in place those four pillars and then we will then we'll look at start looking at other issues um, now, if you would like, I appreciate that this is really focusing on the Christian worldview, which is a particular um, kind of understanding of, of Christianity. I mean, it's kind of an overview, if you like. But if you would like a more general explanation of the Christian message, then I, can, um, I, I would say look at my other channel, which is Understand the Bible. And that's um, understandthebible.uk. I'll put the link down below. Um, but it, uh, that's really intending just to kind of teach the Bible and teach the Christian faith in a more general way. Whereas here, what I'm what I'm doing is teaching it in a more kind of particular, uh, what more particular way. So that's what we're going to be doing over these uh, these coming weeks. Now, if you would like to do any reading about this, if you'd like to read around the topic yourself, then I've just put a, a couple of books there that you might be interested in. Uh, one is The Universe Next Door uh, by James W. Sire. And this is a kind of worldview catalogue. He looks at lots of different um, worldviews in the world and um, talks about talks about them. So you might find that an interesting book, looking at and comparing um, different worldviews. Um, you might also enjoy The God Who Is There by Francis Schaeffer. This was a book I mentioned, uh, I think, two or three weeks ago on the podcast. Um, but I think Francis Schaeffer was excellent at worldviews and about how the Christian worldview is, is what's being eroded from Western society. And he says it began in the early part of the 20th century, particularly, and has just progressed uh, since then. And how we've kind of he talks about crossing the line of despair, going under the line of despair. Um, and I think it's a really good book at looking at how you know Christianity is. Um, is the thing which is missing from our society and is, is what we need. So you might like to have a look at that as well. And um, there are other books of his which I can recommend too. Um, if there are any particular books that you appreciate or enjoy or any comments you have, do feel free to let me know in the comments below on YouTube or do join in on uh, Telegram uh, t.me forward slash um, Phil Saker. You can, um, uh, the, the link will be down below. Um, or you can just email me in at sacredmusingspod at gmail.com and I can always talk about um, talk about any emails in the next uh, session. So I hope that you're looking forward to learning about the Christian worldview and how to how to build that, um, what it means. Um, and that will begin uh, next week. So let's finish the podcast with a reflection from the Bible. And I thought that um, what I was going to, what I'm going to do from now on, for the, the next few little while anyway, um, I had been doing a biblical reflection, taking you know just any old random part of the Bible which I happen to be thinking about. But I wondered maybe it would be good to start working through a particular book of the Bible, a particular part of the Bible, 
And while we're looking at worldviews, I thought it might be good to look at the book of Romans. Romans is really, it's a tour de force by the Apostle Paul of, of the gospel, of the Christian message and what it means. And it's going through a, a lot of the, the same kind of stuff, but in a very different um, way. Um, I've always found Romans quite intimidating, actually. I mean, I never preached through it. Um, but it, it's it, I mean, no part of the Bible should be intimidating. It's all good. And, you know, so I, I thought, let's now why don't we just go through the book of Romans and I'll just read it and then we'll we'll think about it. And it'll be like a little Bible study, I suppose. But just, uh, you know, very short, just at the end of the podcast to help us think uh, about um, part of, of this and how it relates to what's happening in the world and, and the way that God wants us to be. So let's read um, from the, the, the beginning of it now. This is Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. And just a word on Bible translations. I'm using the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible. I know some people don't like it. Some people prefer all different Bible translations. I think this one is quite a good balance of readability in modern language and accuracy to the Greek text of the New Testament. But you might prefer a different Bible translation, and that's absolutely fine. You know that um, it's all it's all the Bible, and um, you know as long as um, we are talking about the Bible, then that's the main thing. But I just wanted to let you know which translation I was using. So this is Romans chapter one, reading from verse one. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul, he begins almost all of his letters in the same way and there's a kind of a little greeting and this is the way that letters began in those days. Um, There's so much you could say. I mean, this is kind of like the the overture of a symphony you know it's it's got all of the themes in here which Paul is going to expand through the rest of the book Um, and that's characteristic of the way that Paul writes Um, and this is I mean there's so much you could say just about these few verses here but Paul says he is an apostle he's one who's been apostle just means sent you know he's sent by God and he's sent and set apart for the gospel that all through history, God has set apart people who teach and preach the gospel. And I think God has set me apart as and other pastors to sort of to to preach, to teach the gospel. Um, So I kind of, if you like, share in that, that sort of ministry from Paul of being sent by God to teach and to preach. Um, And it's a gospel which has been promised. And it's, it's all about Jesus regarding the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And um, uh, and it says through him, we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. So it's through Christ that we received uh, that grace and um, and they're to proclaim it to the Gentiles. Remember that at, at that time that, you know, that um, Christianity came out of uh, Judaism, you know, that, um, of course, you know, the Jews were. Um, Jesus was Jewish and you know that that they early Christians met in the synagogues and then it, it grew and developed into its own thing and became very different from um, from um, Judaism um, sadly um, that there are many Jews who did not and still do not accept um, Jesus as the Messiah but the door is now wide open to everyone you know that this is a worldwide global message um, it made me think, actually, you think about the the World Economic Forum and, you know, how we're all, you know, um, one world government and what have you, all of that kind of thing. And that's, this is this is what they're aspiring to. You know, actually, it's God who had that idea 
and who who um, has accomplished it through Jesus. It's one message, one Lord of all. And um, the, the thing I love about this, it says the obedience that comes from faith, the obedience that comes from faith. It doesn't say um, the faith that that um, uh, the obedience that leads to faith, but the obedience that comes from faith, saying that, you know, when we have faith in God, that is when we believe uh, that's when we, we act differently. It's when we believe and trust in him, when we believe and trust in Jesus, that we start to obey him. That's how it works. You know, we don't obey him in order to earn his approval, but we trust in him and then our lives change. And that's such a fundamental thing um, that, um, you know, this is the message of the Reformation. This is the, the key message which they rediscovered, if you like, at the time of the Reformation. And this is the message of the Book of Common Prayer. And I often think of how different um, in England and the English are to other countries where this the Reformation did not take hold. And it's because of this message that makes the big difference at the end of the day. It's the, the obedience that comes from faith, not, not needing to obey in order to earn uh, God's approval. And um, a lovely message there, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message. That's the message of, of the gospel, that you know we have received grace and peace from God. And that is very, very good news for us. You know, we, we receive that that peace with God through Jesus Christ. And it's something that we can we can enjoy in him. So I hope that you'll enjoy uh, looking through Romans with me. Um, I, I glossed over a, a lot there, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Uh, why don't you read it yourself and have a little think about it yourself and let us know what your thoughts are um, about Romans, if anything strikes you. Um, and we can you know talk about it together. But we'll finish now the podcast with a, a prayer and ask God to help us now um, to begin to really understand these things, not just the Bible, but also all of the other things going on. So let's let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have received uh, grace and peace from you through Jesus Christ and that all who believe and trust in the Lord Jesus um, are um uh, look forward to that day when uh, one day we will see you and we will be in that new creation where everything is restored and perfect. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us as we think about um, uh, the Christian worldview. We pray that you would help us to understand that more and more for ourselves and what that means for not just for the way that we live our own lives, but the way that um, society should be and the difference that we can make in our communities and in the world. We pray, Heavenly Father, and commit to you the the um, terrible things which are happening in the world at the moment and um, all of the problems in the world. We want to pray for the, the problem of the terrorism and we pray, Lord, that those in power would um, be able to, to re uh, react to these things in truth, not on ideology, and um, particularly the problem of this uh, Islamist terrorism that our politicians and our media would will, will be able to face up to it in truth. And that we pray, Heavenly Father, for the, the vaccines, the rollout to children, and pray, Lord, that you would protect children um, who are being um, perhaps coerced into taking a vaccine which they don't need. And ask, Lord, that you would cause those who um, are pushing this to have a change of heart and that they will be able to see the, uh, the damage which is being done. Um, but we do commit that to you, Lord, and pray that um, those who need to be held to account will be. And uh, we ask, Lord, that your your justice would, would shine out and be done. So we pray, Lord, for all of these things and commit ourselves, our lives to you now and those we love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining me today. Um, if you'd like, um, you can join in with the comments if you're on YouTube or you can go on telegram t.me forward slash philsaker. The link is below. Um, if you'd like to email me, that's sacredmusingspod at gmail.com 
and there is a buy me a coffee link if you'd like to express your uh, appreciation in a financial way and I do um, really appreciate that but all of those things it's lovely to to hear from you just to, to hear that um, you know you're appreciating this and everything so thanks so much everyone I look forward to seeing you uh, for the next one next week and in the meantime God bless <laughs>